Um, another point you mentioned in here, uh, this is coming out of left field, uh, uh, is when Mary Lincoln met Abraham, and you write that, that the stories of Mary having first met Abraham while sporting elegant New Orleans fashions, you say is highly romanticized. Uh, but then again, uh, I thought that not only fashions, furniture, everything, a, a, a predominance of yeah. merchandise and fashion came up from New Orleans. For instance, when the uh, state house that you talked about, uh, the old state house in Springfield, was reconditioned back in uh, the late 1960s and saved with the state library underneath, and they had to furnish it. And lo and behold, they found a warehouse in New Orleans that had furniture from the 1830s mm -hmm. that they were able to purchase. They were so happy yeah, for, yeah. and so were the, the, the people who owned the furniture, and they, they got you know pennies in the dollar, but they were very happy. So that's what's in there. So things were coming right, up there. So sure, sure. wouldn't it be logical to think that maybe Mary did have oh, the fashion? Certainly. The reason why I use romanticized, that particular source, mm -hmm. uh, the, the, the context of the rest of the paragraph was rather romanticized. So I wanted to to, uh, to, to, you know, to cast that sense there. Yeah. But there's no good. The, the Todd family of Lexington uh, had all sorts of interactions with, with New Orleans. Uh, and she, by the way, she spoke French. Uh, it wasn't, it, you know, it was, it was a learned French. It wasn't uh, from her family. Uh, and um, one of the, the interesting interactions, I have a chapter uh, on Lincoln and, as opposed to in, Lincoln and New Orleans from 31 to the end of the war. Uh, just to kind of wrap up the story there. And one interesting one, those of you who are well acquainted with New Orleans, if you ever walk around the lower French Quarter on almost any night, uh, this new phenomena of the ghost tour has uh, popped up in the past 10 years. Gettysburg, too. Yes, uh, where, um, where these, these uh, kind of actors give these ghost tours uh, to tourists. And there, the must-see stop is the LaLaurie Mansion on Royal Street. And uh, the, the, the underlying story there was in 1834, uh, this wealthy Creole woman uh, had, uh, was caught after a fire, was discovered by her neighbors as really maltreating her slaves, uh, almost viciously, uh, chained up. And this was recorded in the New Orleans Bee and has since been whipped up into uh, you know, a, a rather uh, hy hyperbolic story. But, but uh, the version that was- Her name was, was Madame Lollery. Uh, Lollery. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the New Orleans B version, just to show you how New Orleans served to diffuse stories as well as furniture and everything else, that story made it to Kentucky. Mary Todd read it and was pointedly, specifically horrified by it uh, and shared it with her, her cousin. And, and uh, uh, you know, she describes how it helped transform her view. This was a slaveholding family. Uh, and how she assisted uh, her one of her slaves in, in um, accommodating uh, runaways, uh, and so later she marries Abraham Lincoln. So there's a neat little New Orleans connection. There. I can't see Mary Lincoln marrying someone who didn't feel the same way as her yeah. about the institution of slavery. Yeah. And yeah. when people talk about Lincoln perhaps not having that view in his mind, I mean, I, I think he rose above. We, he certainly had some racist feelings in him. How could he have not have growing up where he was? Yet he rose above them within himself to know at least they were human beings and deserved the equality of opportunity. And I think that was that's an important thing that brought the two of them mm -hmm, together. Mm -hmm. I mean, he, you know, going back to my uh, my error before in 1831 when he first saw New Salem and came across uh, Billy the Barber, uh, William Florville, mm -hmm. who became his personal barber and brought him to the White House later on. Uh, he also helped him in New Salem by finding him a job. He was a stranger. Right, right. Exactly. And he saw him at the wharf right. there and took him in and helped, right. uh, helped found, uh, find a job for him. So I think he went above those racist feelings. And I think that you go into this in the book as well, how it imbued him with that. And not that he didn't have it before, but it... Right. It helped that along. And uh, Billy the Barber had a New Orleans connection as well. This, this is a, he was a free man of color of uh, Haitian ancestry, francophone, and uh, he made the mistake in the, I believe the early 1820s, of traveling to New Orleans at a time when that free people of color, uh, which was kind of this middle caste, New Orleans 
had this system that was rather alien to the rest of North America of there being a, a, a free a uh, person of color cast between free white and enslaved black. And increasingly as the city Americanized, that class became, came under attack. And so um, he got out about a year later, he realized his mistake. Uh, so I could just imagine the conversations between Lincoln and his barber about New Orleans and Haiti and his experiences. Well, another, uh, another connection with New Orleans that you show was a different case of a, another man, yes. uh, the Shelby John case, Shelby, who yeah. got down there and had a worse right. time down in New Orleans. You don't have to read it to really go into that. Uh, but uh, he wandered down there, and Lincoln, from afar, was, uh, was a help mm -hmm. in getting him back mm -hmm. up north. Mm -hmm. Uh, at that time. Uh, you may have to go into the book to get into that, um, but that flatboat experience of his uh, may have contributed to the imagery of that dream of his, uh, continuing dream before important events, if you remember that, uh, that he was floating to an unknown or indefinite shore the night before he was murdered, he had that. So that imagery was interesting how you brought that up, that may have really stuck with him unconsciously and kept coming up with him. Yeah. He made reference to it throughout his life. Now in 1860, and I'll go to any questions you might have after this, but there are a couple of things I just need to get in. Mm -hmm. um, the imagery in the 1860 campaign that you bring up, and you speak about Wide this wide-awake songster, and here at the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, we just have one. <laughs> so uh, not that it can't be yours, or yours if you'd like as well out there in, uh, in blog land. Uh, on page 58 of this Wide Awake Songster, uh, there is a song called Lincoln Boat Horn. And uh, the second verse here I'll read. Hushed is the clangor of the forge and hammer, the plowboy's whistle where the daisies grew. Quiet the loud reverberating clamor of woodsman's axe and piner's hello. They visit entranced to the song of labor whose notes in triumph from the boat horn flow. And friend with kindling eye, kindling eye, proclaims to neighbor, thine is the music taught us long ago. The hymn we know, Lincoln, thou boatman of the Sangamo. Later they say Lincoln, the boatman, is the people's friend. So here is the rail splitter image. Now, they shove that to the side. He really was a boatman. Right. Uh, in terms of the political imagery, um, uh, the the most famous the one that worked the most was of course Lincoln the rail splitter, uh, and that that sort of individualized heroism of the the lone axeman in the woods uh, lent itself perfectly to the to the iconography of the campaign. Number two after the rail splitter is the log cabin, and to this day just about every American child could make reference to Lincoln in a log cabin. But number three in terms of that political. Uh, 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 symbolism was was the flatboat uh, and there's I have a couple of uh, broadsides depicted in the color section here there's one that I really love that has all three embedded uh, it has Lincoln it has uh, some narrative around the borders is the split rail fence there's a log cabin in each corner and then the flatboat right in the middle now the flatboat brought some prop there's a reason why it wasn't number one uh, it brought some problems where the flatboatman had a reputation uh, it also didn't, because it's a group activity, it didn't quite pictographically lend itself to the, to the, uh, the, the hero of the frontier. Uh, and uh, the Wide Awakes... Yes, it and, was uh, used. I mean, it was sheets. used, exactly. I see that. Right. Uh, even Emancipation Proclamations, That's I right. see that sometimes That's in right. there. Mm -hmm. uh, they did use That's it. That's right. Oh, yeah. But you're right, the, uh, the axe was it. It. It, it, wasn't, it wasn't perfect. It was useful, but it, it wasn't number one for a reason. But that really went away. Flatboats pretty much disappeared by the Civil War. Well, I mean, uh, in, in yeah. historical consciousness, uh, yes, and historians yes, and yes. iconographers. Yeah. Well, I hope to reverse that. Yes, I <laughs> agree with you on that. Um, another incident I just want to ask you about. Uh, did you find any evidence of Lincoln responding to the beasts? Uh, ben Butler, General Ben Butler's order, a general order, which number was it, uh, 28, oh, I think, uh, that if a woman should insult this is after New Orleans was recaptured, or captured, or just brought back into the Union, I suppose, never really left, according to Lincoln. Um, that if a woman should insult or show contempt for any officer or soldier of the United States, she shall be regarded and treated as a woman of the town, plying her avocation. Mm. 
did, did you ever see Lincoln? I, uh, others yeah. did. I certainly, I can tell you that Beauregard went nuts yeah. and yeah. Uh, put his own order out. But did yeah. you see any indication of Lincoln? I, I didn't specifically anything? search for that, yeah. and, and no, I, I hadn't. But it, it, uh, it, it outraged uh, many members of the city. Uh, regarding Benjamin Butler, uh, if, you, um, if you look at many secondary and tertiary historical uh, descriptions of that era. To this day, tour guides uh, depict Benjamin Butler as being loathed by the New Orleans populace. He was loathed by a portion of New Orleanians. African Americans uh, saw very, but Butler very differently. Uh, and um, so, you know, that, that, that whole era is kind of the, 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 kind of the, you know, the, the cap to the story here of, of uh, Lincoln's relationship to Louisiana and New Orleans at the, at the peak of his presidency. Well, there is so much in here. Uh, I just, some of the questions that I haven't had a chance to really get to that, uh, uh, for instance, how you examine the problems of time and space and place, uh, fascinating how you delved into this. The Navigator. Uh, will be explained in here, and it's a fascinating uh, resource that you had on the on the boat, mm -hmm. uh, boatmen, boats. The navigator was a journal, mm -hmm. and it's in here. Uh, you relate the story of Lincoln learning his very earning his very first dollar, and skirt the requirement for a flat a flat uh, boat license. Um, so these and others are in here that are fascinating. I think for people uh, to read that imbue it with Lincoln, but all others as well. Um, this is going to be coming when? We don't have a date. We don't have March. a date. Uh, just to let you know of something coming in virtual book signing uh, upcoming, uh, The Dark Days of Abraham Lincoln's Widow, uh, as revealed by her own letters. Uh, Myra Helmer Pritchard and, uh, wrote this and is edited and annotated by Jason Emerson, who has done some wonderful work on Mary Lincoln, the madness of Mary Lincoln. He's been here at this table as well. And we'll let you know. Make sure, if you're watching us for the first time, that you send in your email so we'll be able to let you know of this and other programs that are coming uh, at the virtual book signing uh, experience and broadcast. Anyone here have a last question? Uh, briefly, please. I noticed in reading um, Herndon's manuscript version that he sent to um, uh, Lincoln's son, Robert Todd Lincoln, for approval before it was published. He wrote of his flatboat days and said that um, a friend of his, they were, they were taking livestock onto yes. the boat, and there were pigs, and the pigs didn't want to go on the boat. And to uh, make them go on the boat and stay on the boat, the, Lincoln took a needle and thread and sewed their eyes shut. Uh, was that common practice on the river? And what do you make of that? Because I know Robert Lincoln crossed out the whole page yeah. and said, you can't prove this, and this shows Lincoln in a bad light. Yeah. Uh, in so many words. Yeah. Uh, did you encounter that? In yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, it, it, it. Uh, it's in the book. Yeah, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm quite certain that's a true story. Uh, it, there's a number of other recollections of it. Uh, the, it's called the Hog's Eye Affair, and uh, you know, you, you can't, you can't even look at a pig without having it squeal. Could you imagine? Lincoln was actually quite uncomfortable with that task. Uh, famously, he was. Uh, sensitive to the to the suffering of animals, uh, and uh, he came to regret that incident. And I can't believe that it even came close to working. It must have agitated the the livestock even more. Now, wh where they might have sold uh, those hogs, uh, I'm not really sure. I wondered about that. Um, but livestock on a flatboat were a problem. With with each passing day. You lose more and more. Uh, you know, some die. You have to feed them. You have to bring the food with you. So my sense is the the inclination was to to, to trade them off as soon as possible. Thank you. Uh, before we have to leave, I I think this is an important part of your book. At the end, that I uh, I'd like you to briefly tell us about. Okay. Uh, you speak of Joseph Campbell's 1948 book, The Hero with a Thousand Faces. Uh, explain the concept and how that pertains to Lincoln. Yeah, the, this this it's um, a mono myth. Is yes, what we're the, about. the 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 so-called mono myth. Uh, I, I've always been amazed at how consistently this these brief voyages and the little that was known about them that it, they play a consistently important role in all Lincoln. Just about every one of these biographies here, from child's books to to scholarly tomes. Uh, and I came to kind of explore what might be the reason for that. 
uh, and I was uh, I recollected, um, you know, this this work of the 1940s where a mythologist Joseph Campbell looked at all these myths across um, uh, human history and found commonalities in them. And one of the reoccurring t themes was that of the transformative long journey. And and here's the monomyth that he discovered that so many of the everything from the Bible to Moby Dick to Star Wars. Uh, where you have this uh, rather ordinary figure who's inspired and encouraged by elders to go on this long trip to prove himself. He goes on this long journey. He has this transformative experience. He battles. He's engaged in, in, in fights. And he, he gains some sort of, of um, you know, something precious. And, and, and it might be a, a learning, a wisdom. And he makes his way back and he saves his people. And, and, and this aligns uh, remarkably well with, with exactly this, that he goes on this long trip reluctantly, is encouraged by elders, is expected of him, and he's, he's almost murdered in, in uh, just outside of New Orleans. He gains this knowledge, he comes back, and he saves his people. Now, the, this is a critical examination. I'm not endeavoring to put the whole New Orleans experience up on a pedestal here or, or to... to to bring a kind of a triumphalist narrative to this. It's a critical examination. There's some, there, there's some notions here where, uh, you know, I kind of challenge the, the conventional wisdom here, but I was a, r amazed at how, at how, uh, how it paralleled the monomyth. Yeah, and there's a sequence of famous paintings that were popular in the 1840s of uh, the, the Voyage of Life. You might be familiar with these. There's four of uh, uh, childhood, adolescence, manhood, and old age. That and they're all based on rivers, and you have each of the figures of those four stages of life boarding a boat and going down. And I was amazed next time you're in his home that in his dining room to this day is the one of youth, of the voyage of life colon youth. And here's this young man boarding, and I have an image of here boarding this boat to go off into that long term. I have to say, the imagery, the illustrations area in here is wonderful. and. First of all, they're all color, which really helps. But it's fascinating what you see in there, and it brings to life where you are in the different places that Lincoln was. Uh, so before we're going to say goodbye, just one other quick question. Is there a possibility that uh, New Orleans will not be on the Mississippi River during our own lifetime? Well, the That's concern, broad, yeah, and, that, and there's a Lincoln story there. When he came down in 1831, was right around the era where Captain Henry Shreve was clearing out the log jam and making other improvements on the relationship between the Mississippi River, the Red River, and the Atchafalaya. 120 years later, because of those alterations, more and more water was coming out of the Mississippi system and going down the Atchafalaya to the point that the Army Corps became quite concerned that the channel would jump, send all the, the water down the Atchafalaya, which would leave New Orleans on an increasingly brackish long estuary and the city would become uninhabitable within weeks because what's our drinking source it's the Mississippi River and the old river control structure was put in uh, in uh, around 1960 so hopefully the answer is uh, that will keep the Mississippi in place all right all right Richard thank you so you much for joining us here this was entertaining and fascinating and really informative at least for me uh, now, the book is uh, published by University of Louisiana at Lafayette Press. We appreciate them for sending Rich down. Uh, and anyone else they want to in the future, uh, just get a Lincoln or Civil War theme if we can. We thank all of you for being with us today here in the shop. And please come up and afterwards say hello. And all of you, of course, at home, we appreciate that as well. And if you're watching in the archives, come back again. Remember, email in your emails so that we can contact you again and let you know of future. Uh, broadcast. Thank you all from the Abraham Lincoln Bookshop, the staff here, and again, come back again. Thank you. <laughs>